good evening, everybody. Um, you're very welcome, and it's uh, good to see such a, a lovely turnout uh, on what was a, an Argo, very ap apocalyptic conditions, which uh, might uh, form a, a good background to uh, this evening's talk. Um, I'm uh, David, and uh, I'm uh, hosting this talk on behalf of the uh, Lurgan Townscape Heritage Scheme, which is a regeneration initiative focused on restoring historic buildings within Lurgan Town and promoting the uh, history and heritage of the town. Uh, this uh, the scheme is supported by the Armagh City Banbridge and Ground Borough Council and the National Lottery Heritage Fund, and uh, we thank them very much uh, for their support. Um, now, tonight's uh, talk is actually part of a series of talks that have been focusing on uh, Lurgan in the 18th century. Um, it's a series that we began planning in uh, 2019, but um, of course events intervened, so it's taken us sort of two years to, you know, to try to get to the end of the series. And uh, actually the first uh, time I contacted tonight's speaker was in July of 2019, so you know, it's taken quite a while to bring this talk uh, to Lurgan, but I'm delighted um, that we can finally present it. Uh, the focus of tonight will be on the 1740-41 uh, famine, or uh, the Great Frost Famine of 1740 and 41. Um, not as well known as the Potato Famine of uh, the 1840s, um, but it should be um, because it was just as devastating. In fact, uh, some commentators would say it was proportionately more devastating than the Potato Famine of the 1840s. Now, our uh, speaker uh, tonight is, uh, uh, is come all the way from Dublin. He's uh, David Dixon, who is the uh, Professor Emeritus of Modern History at Trinity College Dublin. Um, he's published widely on the economic, social and cultural history of Ireland, particularly in the 18th century. And indeed, he's actually written a book on tonight's topic, uh, which was published in uh, 1997, entitled Arctic Ireland, uh, The Extraordinary Story of uh, the Great Frost and Forgotten Famine of 1740-41. Qu quite a difficult book to get a hold of now. Um, I tempted to use the cliche that tonight's speaker has literally written the book on the topic um, that we'll be uh, focusing on. So um, we're very much in safe hands as uh, David takes us through uh, the story of what actually happened uh, in 1740 41, how it affected Oregon and Ireland uh, and in the widest sense. So, David, are you happy enough uh, taking charge? Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Thank you to your team for all this wonderful organization. And thank you all for coming out on such an evening. Uh, when I was sitting in the car there about an hour and a half ago, I was wondering, you know, would we get five people who would venture out in that hail? But I think the hail has gone away for the night. But anyway, it's great and uh, lovely to be here. And I will try and live up to that introduction. I'm hoping I can manage between the keyboard and the mic and my notes here, but uh, bear with me if I seem a little flustered at times, I'll do my best. But like everybody, I'm a little bit out of practice with in-person events, and it's a real pleasure to, have to be not to be just relying on Zoom, great and all as Zoom has for other things. But anyway, the, um, where do we start? Well, the book that has been used as a kind of pre-title for tonight was, goes back 25 years, Arctic Ireland, uh, published up the road by White Row, Bel White Row Press in Belfast. Uh, Peter Carr, an independent publisher, uh, who persuaded me to do this <clears throat> back in the mid-90s. And I think I'll just really start and say a word or two about how that book happened, why me, why it. Uh, and I think there's a Logan connection immediately because uh, the person who influenced me as an undergraduate student, as a, as a kind of uh, early postgraduate student, was uh, the late and much beloved Bill Crawford, who, uh, of course, was for many years here in Logan College before he went to the Public Record Office uh, and then to the Folk Museum, uh, the Cultural Relations Commission, etc a person who influenced a great many people, but certainly got me, uh, or reinforced, shall I say, my, my interest in Irish social history, 
Ulster, particularly, but at that stage, Ulster, uh, more than elsewhere. Uh, an interest in the 18th century, an interest in state history, an interest in urban history. Um, and I think also Bill would have probably been one of the people to encourage me to, to look at the numbers, to sort of, not to do necessarily sophisticated geometrics, but certainly to try and look at what everyone was trying to work out for the 18th century in a rigorous fashion. And one of the things way back then, I'm talking about the 1970s, that we were trying to uh, get a handle on was really uh, the history of Irish population growth before the era of the census, the first censuses, which is, uh, in other words, the early 1800s. What was happening to Irish population in the previous century and a half? Now, at that stage, if you like, the, the gospel was that uh, from Ken Connell, the professor in Queens in the, uh, economic history. And he'd written this great book way back in 1950 called The Population of Ireland, 1750-1845. Very fine piece of work. But it gave a view of, if you like, the, the growth of Irish population in the 1700s that was, well, I think open to criticism uh, because it implied a kind of even growth from the time of King William till the time of Queen Victoria, um, a long time indeed. Um, but the material that Connell had used uh, was uh, tax returns, the hearth tax returns uh, for the country, which survived at, at county totals. And with a little bit of encouragement from, from Bill, and I, I started playing around with these. This is very early on in my... Uh, postgraduate life uh, and was kind of developing, if you like, a sense that there's something strange happening in the middle of the 1700s, in the middle of the 18th century, that things that appeared to be going up to, uh, to the 1730s uh, then had a very obvious break in trend in the 1740s. So I became interested a very long time ago in what we might now call the the anomaly of the 1740s, and what appeared to be a real reverse, albeit a temporary reverse, of trend in the growth of taxable houses in Ireland, which is really all we had to go on to think about what was happening to population. So, uh, despite Bill, uh, I became primarily involved in the 1970s with working on a big project, which was my PhD, on the region that made up the, the hinterland of the city of Cork. In other words, the county Cork, much of Kerry, much of Waterford, and looking at the growth of that great Atlantic port of the 18th century and its kind of region that was affected by its growth. Um, I certainly applied some of the things that Bill would have taught me in terms of how to handle estate records uh, for that southern uh, exercise. But what was very striking in the sort of things I was looking at for the far south uh, was, if you like, a very strong sense in what I call literary sources, in the kind of letters written by estate agents, letters uh, written uh, by individuals on the ground, that there was a terrible crisis in the 1740s, um, and particularly in 1740 uh, and 41. In other words, one didn't need numbers uh, one had it there uh, in the estate records uh, and in uh, descriptions uh, which um, are very uh, striking. Now, there's been just one piece of modern writing about this crisis uh, on Ireland by Michael Drake in 1968. Uh, it's the one thing, but uh, unknown to me in the 70s and 80s, there was an American historian now sadly passed, but who was a great kind of old-fashioned style social historian who really believes in getting, you know, amassing a great amount of uh, evidence to confirm uh, a, a thesis. And the work that he was uh, finally producing was this study called Food Shortage, Climatic Variability and Epidemic Disease in Pre-Industrial Europe, the Mortality of the Early 1740s. And this was a study, as I say, by American historian John Post, was his name, uh, looking right across Europe uh, at what was happening there 
in the early 1740s. Now, it actually done a kind of preliminary study in a book called uh, The Last, sub, Last Great Subsistence Crisis of the Western World, uh, which was about post-Napoleonic Europe in the years immediately after Waterloo, uh, when there were indeed terrible harvests and very strange weather conditions that we now know are attributable to the volcanic eruption in what is now Indonesia at Tambura in 1814. That was Post's first book, which uh, in a sense led him to this much bigger study of the 1740s. And the striking finding in Post's book, uh, for, uh, certainly for, for Irish people, was that he argued quite strongly that Ireland was something of an outlier. Ireland was either the worst affected or one of the two worst affected countries uh, across Northern and Central Europe, all of which had been affected by these extraordinary weather conditions. But it was Norway and Ireland that stood out as, the, if you like, having the greatest social consequences. I'll come back to that. But anyway, the, uh, sort of after that, and I'm not quite sure why, uh, dear Peter Carr of White Row Press said, uh, do a wee book on this, I mean, he said, maybe, yeah. And anyway, he was a very persuasive, is a very persuasive character, uh, and uh, out of his persuasions came that book. He'd done one himself on the great wind of 1839, and I think he was into disaster history a bit, because uh, it might sell. And to be fair to him, he was very good as a salesman as well as a publisher, but that's uh, by the way. But anyway, uh, what was this anomaly then that I keep referring to this 1740s uh, pattern of events, extreme weather. We're talking here about the coldest and the driest seasons of the last 300 years in Western Northern Europe, perhaps in the last 700 years, all the way back to the 1300s. We don't know why. Uh, it was, after all, the earlier sta early stages of scientific measurement. Um, so we have little bits of evidence, uh, barometric uh, and, uh, and from uh, rain gauges and so on for England and for uh, the Low Countries and for uh, uh, Germany, from Berlin. But it's, it, it's like the problem of trying to extrapolate from the little bits of hard evidence, marrying that to the, the soft evidence, that we begin to at least see what was happening. Now, let's see if I can work this. To, this is, I know, going to only tease you at the back, but uh, if you take my word for it, this is an attempt made back in 2005 by the uh, climatologists uh, uh, E.T. Jones and Ken uh, Briffa, Jones and Briffa, to using data from a few places and kind of projecting back from modern uh, weather information what seems to be happening in 1740 and 1741. It's particularly the top right that I just say, even down the room you may be able to make out there's a huge anti-cyclone marked here over uh, southern Sweden, uh, and this was creating a flow of uh, air of winds coming in literally from Siberia over England and Ireland, uh, and indeed uh, affecting northern France uh, as well. Now, that doesn't look very dramatic, but in the particular configuration of, of uh, the uh, air, the sort of blocking of the normal uh, Atlantic uh, low pressure that would come in over winter, uh, you had this, uh, the beginning of what was almost like a, a domino effect of strange seasons that last about 21 months. The weather sequence, uh, I'll run through quickly. I, I'd say much more about it in that wee book. Uh, first of all, before this, in the 1730s, you had what were unusually warm conditions and a bit soft winters uh, through the decade. Then, in the days after Christmas of 1739, uh, you had beginning of intensely cold winds, strong winds, persistent winds coming in from the east that plunged temperatures. Uh, now, we don't know exactly here by how much. We know from one of the more uh, 
I think, reliable measure in London, in Stoke Newington, uh, that in either the second or the third week of January, uh, the uh, temperature fell to minus 18 centigrade, which in the old Fahrenheit scale is about between a naught and minus one. Um, so it's, you know, by our standards, not by North American standards, but exceptionally cold and very persistent. So the consequence was, you know, lakes, rivers, even estuaries froze in the last days of 1739. You have, for instance, references in the newspapers uh, to um, dead fish all along the uh, rim of Loch Ness. You have, uh, as a result, the mills were frozen, but the mill wheels couldn't turn, bread couldn't be, a meal couldn't be ground, uh, shipping couldn't move, uh, domesticated animals were directly affected out in the field, huge death of sheep within the first few weeks, uh, cattle to some extent, and uh, horses uh, were particularly uh, badly affected. Wildlife deaths were also noted, uh, and it was, you know, in the first weeks, you know, a result directly of hypothermia. And this was, you know, a phenomenon spreading over much of northern uh, and northwestern Europe. Uh, and initially, there was a certain kind of euphoria uh, here, indeed, uh, the, uh, having a, 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 a feast out of the, off, uh, the Antrim shore uh, and uh, uh, frost fairs on the Liffey. I'm not sure about the Lagan. Uh, and uh, this is a, uh, a contemporary woodcut from London of the Frost Fair on the Thames. Now, you're probably familiar with very fine sort of Dutch landscapes of winter scenes on ice from the 17th century. And actually, the dating of a lot of those continental images of Frost Fairs on ice are from one of the previous awful winters of 1783, sorry, 1683-84, just before uh, the um, Jacobite Williamite Wars. But anyway, the first, if you like, chapter in the story is this intense cold, uh, which was uh, much of it was extremely windy as well. And this lasted for about six weeks. Then you have a, a period uh, uh, from mid-February of 1740, uh, drought, almost total drought for the next three months. Uh, it was very cold, not freezing, but just unseasonably cold, very dry. Um, and that particularly seems to have led to cattle and calf deaths uh, in uh, the west and the south of Ireland. And there's talk by May of 1740 about how the landscape, uh, and this comes from several parts of the country, the landscape turned the colour of brick, uh, or it looked as, as if it was the colour of the, a fox's coat. There were fires in a number of Irish towns with combustible building materials uh, because of this prolonged drought. Um, the summer itself uh, was poor. I mean, the rain uh, came in May, but it was a very poor uh, yield for the harvest. Uh, an autumn uh, of extreme storms, uh, floods, uh, blizzards, culminating in a second great frost, much shorter, a mere two weeks, in the December of 1740. But the thing that comes out to think of that, that, that autumn of 1740 is the amount of rain that was falling in this one reference in the Dublin papers uh, about how you could hear the noise of the Liffey from a distance. So great was the water uh, coming down at one stage. And then uh, into 1741, uh, you had just a very bad winter, a very, very hot summer in uh, 41, and things only began to normalize in the September, 21 months after the beginning of the frost. So it, it, it's an anomaly in all sorts of ways. Now that very quick summary glosses over, a, if you like, the human tragedy uh, following the destruction of the domestic foodstuffs, uh, particularly the potato, 
in the early stages of chapter one, the early stages of the frost. And so you have a, if you like, both a destruction of food and a public health crisis uh, following that, uh, which um, gravely affected, obviously, those who were uh, uh, hungry, but also those of higher social sta station because of the transmission of, uh, if you like, famine fevers, particularly typhus. Um, just want to quote you here one comment, which uh, is particularly graphic from West Cork uh, about uh, the scene. This is towards the end of the, the, the crisis, but I, I read it and you'll see why. Um, mortality, wrote Richard Cox and Don Manway in their bantry, mortality is now no longer heeded. The instances are so frequent. And burying the dead, which used to be one of the most religious acts, is now become a burden, so that I am daily forced to make those who remain carry dead bodies to the churchyards, which would otherwise rot in the open air. Otherwise, I assure you, the common practice is to let the tree lie where it falls. And if some good-natured uh, person covers it with the next ditch, it's most to be, it's most to be expected. In short, by all I can learn, the dreadfulest civil war or the most raging plague never destroyed as many as this season. This is written in the spring of 41. The distempers and famine increase so that it is no vain fear that there will not be hand sufficient to save the harvest. There will not be hand sufficient to save the next harvest. Now, that's you know, by no means a uh, unique kind of observation as to what was happening. And the food crisis, um, the, the food crisis was in fact um, immediately evident from the first weeks of the frost because potatoes which had been either not dug out of the ground or which were lying in very shallow uh, pits uh, were almost immediately uh, turned into liquid. In other words, more than 80%, I would estimate, of the potato crop taking the country as a whole was destroyed. And that is greater than was lost in, say, the, uh, in, in, in 1846, in the, in the, on the eve of the, the worst part of the, the Great Famine. The, such was the destruction. Um, again, one more quote from my wee book, which um, uh, this is again from Cork. The eating potatoes are all destroyed. This is even in January 1740, early on. The eating potatoes are all destroyed, which many think will be followed by a famine among the poor. And if the small ones, which are not bigger than large peas, and which, are, which be deepest in the ground, are so destroyed as not to serve for seed, there must be a sore famine next year in 1741. If no potatoes remain sound for seed, I think this frost, the most dreadful calamity that ever befell this poor kingdom. This poor kingdom. So, I think the uh, thing is that, that you can say in most of Ireland, by 1740, uh, small farming families and labouring families were principally dependent already on the potato for most of their nutrition. Um, uh, potato varieties that were then around didn't keep the full year. So even if you like a dependence on the potato meant a dependence up to Patrick's Day or up to uh, Easter time, and then meal would be the, the main source. Even in the far southwest, uh, would be the main source of foodstuff until the potato uh, ripened in <coughs> mid or late summer. But mapping that rise of the potato spatially and socially is, is, is difficult. But I think we can see in 1730, by 1739, a real kind of southwest, northeast uh, divide. Uh, and while potatoes were certainly important hereabouts in central Ulster, um, and while we know, for instance, that new potatoes, early potatoes, were uh, coasted down from Loch Swilly down to Dublin 
uh, already at that stage, um, which tells us at least about the importance in Donegal. Um, really, uh, the folks of Lurgan would have been mo overwhelmingly uh, much more used to bread and stirabout, to veg and broth, as uh, the dominant foodstuffs, even of those in the poor parts of town. So, thinking of this locally, what of oats, what of wheat in, say, 1740 or 41? Well, of course, prices went up, even if the harvest hadn't been bad, because of those who were forced to move earlier into uh, oatmeal consumption with the loss of the potato. Um, but in fact, there is a huge uh, growth of uh, prices in any kind of foodstuff that affected nearly uh, everybody. Well, how... Let me just move this on a little bit. So I'm just, that's a kind of one of the atmospheric images in the, in the wee book for, that um, was commissioned from uh, Geoffrey Fulton uh, to capture this sort of desolation of the great frost weeks themselves. And that's our attempt to try and show the, the counties apparently most directly affected in uh, 1740 by the loss of principally the potato. Uh, but the effect of elevated uh, food prices uh, generally. And yeah, that's the image I wanted there. So, you know, how are we to sort of write the history of this event? Because, you know, there isn't the kind of archives that you have in abundance by the time you get to the Great Famine. Uh, it, you know, there's a real kind of evidential scarcity. You yes, some newspapers, particularly for Dublin, uh, the first newsletter is only just beginning. Uh, you have pamphlets like The Groans of Ireland, this one is one of about half a dozen essays written during the crisis You've, where they survive, uh, estate archives and the commentary from uh, people trying to run uh, landed estates. You have the parish registers uh, of the Church of Ireland where they survive in the last three minutes. In some places you have town, you have urban corporation records, you have tax returns which give some kind of uh, crude uh, indication as well. And then you have what you might call the proxy data, uh, the use of scientific measurements from outside the country that can be sort of uh, projected across to try and work out what may have been going on. And of course you have the, the other types of evidence like dendrochronology uh, to try and see through the study of the tree rings how exceptional the year the years were. Well, there's absolutely no doubt that the crisis affected the country unevenly. Um, and the question, of course, is the Great Frost itself, was it likely to have been more severe here in the north than in the south? There is a slight temperature gradient in, from, in many winters across the country. Uh, I asked the question, I suppose, particularly with Loch Ney in mind, um, and an image from the UTV archive of the winter of 1963, and somebody driving a mini, presumably not so far from Oxford Island, uh, when there was perhaps the last, not the last, but certainly the, I think the, 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 the frost that a lot of older people will remember, I mean, 1947, uh, more intense. Uh, but as I say, is Loch Ness a factor in how that event would have played out here? Is Loch Ness something of a kind of storage heater uh, that would have kept temperatures slightly higher? Or is it so sort of shallow that that wouldn't have been the way it went? I, I, I don't know. I suspect it didn't actually make a great deal of, of difference. But I think the point is that the intensity of the frost would have been felt here almost certainly uh, as much as uh, you know, any part uh, of the northern half of the country. And yet, this region seems to have come out uh, a great deal better. So what I wanted to try and do is just sort of think about that for a few minutes. Why should the region, why should Lurgan area particularly, 
have been uh, perhaps a little bit less severely affected at that moment. Now, I mean, we have the great work done on parish Church of Ireland, parish registers, uh, in this neighbourhood. I'm dependent here on the work of people like Robert Greer, Valerie Morgan, Francis McCrory, uh, Pat Worthington, others that I may not be aware of, trying to sort of get a sense through handling kind of problematic data uh, to see what it might tell us about 1740 or 1741 from the point of view of either elevated burials or, if you like, uh, a, a kind of a number of missing baptisms, a sort of depression uh, of uh, baptisms because of uh, public, uh, uh, public ill health. Well, I'm not going to go through all that data because it is and it's difficult to summarise, uh, but here for Lurgan, for Sh Parish of Shank Hill, uh, the burial data for 1441 uh, isn't there to help us. Uh, Maharalin, uh, we have a sense that burials have perhaps go up about 50% in 1741. In Siegel, uh, in 1741, they appear to double on the levels of the 1720s and 30s. You know, which is telling us, yes, these are very bad seasons, uh, and uh, what more can we say? I'll come back to that issue about who was in the data, what age group uh, we're talking about, but certainly there's no doubt that these were hard, terrible years, but the point is you don't have here what has been found for a few parishes in Munster, where the Church of Ireland uh, burials are recording uh, the effect of the death of the whole community. In other words, Catholic and possibly dissenter burials, as well as Church of Ireland, as well as Anglican burials, are all being recorded in a few parish registers. Uh, one for Limerick City, for St Mary's, one for McCroom in County Cork, uh, possibly one for uh, Wicklow. Uh, but leave one in absolutely no doubt about the horror of what was happening. In other words, I think it's in McCroom that you have something like a, a, a three and a half fold jump in the level, or, or the normal level of death, uh, and uh, something almost as bad in St. Mary's uh, in Limerick. And it's on the basis of those little hints and some kind of qualitative statements from Protestant clergy that, in a sense, we can sort of set that against the evidence of the tax fall in the 1740s, going back to what I was starting with, uh, the, 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 the tax on houses, to really, I think, have a fairly strong case for saying that there's a, a population fall between 1739 and 1742 that may be as high uh, as 12 or 13% of the whole. Now, that, that, I think, is a pretty kind of uh, soft estimate. But I think it's, if you look, it's a starting point, and I, there's one or two people who are uh, coming back and looking again at these figures uh, and perhaps getting a slightly more nuanced uh, view. But it's certainly possible, as David was saying at the beginning, to suggest that the death rate proportionately, given Ireland's population is much smaller, that the death rate proportionately in 40 and 41 was greater than in the Great Famine itself. So the question that's relevant here is why did the Ulster counties, and specifically a district like this, apparently get off lightly? Um, right. Yeah, that's simply a map uh, that is trying to show where the greatest falls of taxed houses of half tax payments. Well, so the, the darker colours in the south and in parts of the west, Galway, Roscommon, uh, up to Leitrim, and, uh, and, um, particularly Leitrim and Cavan, are uh, uh, among the worst effects. And the kind of red belt there, uh, including Armagh, is the area where there is actually a slight increase between 1733 and 1744. Now, those figures I wouldn't get too excited about, but they, they, if you like, you have to close one eye and so I think, well, what, what's that perhaps suggesting? But I think, look, let's be clear. There's no question that the impact here 
was great, but it was much less than in other parts of the country. So the question is why? And I think obviously the first one is what I've touched on already, the, uh, that the destruction of the potato uh, had, a, uh, had a less severe effect on a cereal dependent uh, district uh, like uh, the Lagan Valley, uh, the Upper Man Valley. What other reasons are there? Well, you had in many parts of Plantation Ulster a far better developed what you might call social infrastructure for coping with poverty than further south. Church of Ireland, the parish vestry operated a kind of rather patchy uh, poor law uh, in those parishes with a mixed population. Uh, poor, I mean, uh, poor law for paupers of the parish who were not confined to their own uh, members of the, the Church of Ireland. Um, and we know that here in, in the parish of Shank Hill, there was indeed a very busy vestry, um, in effect running the town with the support uh, of the Brownlows. Uh, and you, know, you find a fairly common pattern in east and parts of north Ulster where uh, the kind of Church of Ireland infrastructure was uh, surprisingly strong at that point. I say surprisingly because a kind of inherited view is that it was just skeletal in its operation. It's, it's more than that. And it's thanks to the survival of vestry books that we can see this. Uh, and there's been a lot of recent work done on them. And then, so linked to that, in areas like this, uh, where you have a normally resident landlord and a relatively uh, financially sound landlord, there's kind of a measure of philanthropic response at moments of crisis. And the very fact that here and hereabouts you have relatively medium-sized or smaller landed estates uh, meant that there is a greater responsiveness uh, to a uh, crisis. Um, I mean, the most, ex the most uh, if you like, quoted example of landlord philanthropy was on the Connolly estates. This is the Connollys originally of Ballyshannon, uh, but with land in, around Kildare, and Dublin, and about eight other Irish counties. Um, and uh, Connolly and his widow, Catherine Connolly, uh, are associated with certainly philanthropic action. This particular monument here, be familiar to some of you, uh, outside uh, a Castle Town House at Selbridge, was of course uh, a public work project by Catherine Connolly, started during the crisis and uh, apparently cost about £300 uh, to complete. It's over 100 feet high, so I'm sure that isn't an exaggeration. And there are other mo monuments, uh, notably the uh, Kalini Hill Obelisk, uh, which were also, if you like, public works or other private works by landlords uh, giving emergency uh, employment. So that's you know, a general point. I, there's no a particular great monument here in uh, Lurgan, but we know that um, the, uh, the lady, uh, the widow, uh, Lady Brownlow, uh, contributed some £44 to such of the poor tenants of Master Brownlow uh, who have suffered of late in, in, in the late frost. Interesting, the £44 in the vestry book, by the time it was reported in Dublin in the newspapers, had grown to 440. Uh, and uh, when I first came, well, indeed, it's used by one of the modern historians. Like, a fantastic donation by Lady Brown. As I say, there's a naught been added to it, but that doesn't get around the point. But it was, you know, the kind of contribution, if it came quickly, it could have made a, a, a real difference. Now, of course, the Lurgan district uh, was, in a wider way, the beneficiary of unusually, uh, unusual kind of estate development. Um, and I mean, all of you here don't need to be told just how distinctive it is. The fact you've got this continuity of ownership of the Brownlows and that great archive that's now in the public record of it. And I, I think, you know, even if we didn't have that great archive, you could see that uh, the Brownlow Logan story is distinctive in a, in, in a positive way in terms of engaging with uh, what creates employment and wealth. In the previous generation, 
Um, and I'm thinking here, of course, particularly of the linen industry, uh, which was uh, up to a point implanted by uh, the uh, by Brownlow uh, action in the 1680s and 1690s. And the growth of that linen industry since then, in other words, the 50 years before the Great Frost, uh, you know, did bring spending power, the possibility even of savings to ordinary tenants uh, so that they could afford in times when prices were soaring uh, the price in the markets of grain uh, or whatever. And linen prices stayed up uh, in the course of this crisis uh, and linen uh, sales were, were not, I mean, judging by the level of exports from Dublin, which is where Logan Linen went at that stage, uh, the linen trade was in a strong position uh, through the, the early 40s. Um, and that, in a sense, kept money uh, turning. So as long as employment and market sales were buoyant, the impact of very high grain prices was softened, uh, at least. The fourth factor, I'm not really convincing, I'm not convinced myself that this may apply here, but we know, looking at the development of this horrible crisis, of the importance of kind of typhus and smallpox and other related epidemics, uh, that the outbreaks tended to follow the movements of people going towards the ports, going towards centres of uh, emergency, uh, emergency relief, and going towards places where prices were just a little bit lower. In other words, these were the conduit lines uh, of infection. So towns that were on major thoroughfares were, I think, and I'm sort of playing around with this a little bit at the moment myself, I think more likely to have been badly hit than towns that weren't. Now, I know Lurgan was on the road from Belfast to Armagh, but it wasn't on the road, it wasn't on certain other roads. So maybe the level of sort of through movement here was a little less uh, than, say, through Banbridge. I don't know, but I think certainly in the south that was a, a major consideration as to whether the places escaped or not. It's a point I sort of leave hanging. Um, now, let me introduce a figure that it's a bad image, I apologize, but is important to the what is the next, if you like, next big part of this story. This is the Church of Ireland Archbishop of Armagh at that stage, Hugh Bolter, who was uh, an Englishman, parachuted in to uh, this position in uh, living in Dublin, not in Armagh, in 1724, and lived in Ireland until his death in 1744. Is uh, buried in Westminster Abbey, and you can see his tomb there. But Bolter is an interesting figure. Now he's quite well known for the, because he was a very important political figure. As Archbishop of Armagh, he was, in effect, a, a regular deputy for the Lord Lieutenant when the Lord Lieutenant and entourage were not in Dublin. In other words, outside the parliamentary seasons, Bolter and two other leading uh, uh, office holders, in a sense, were the government of Ireland. And Bolter's influence, particularly with the Prime Minister Walpole, was uh, pretty strong. So Bolter is somebody who, I mean, he wasn't building up a great personal uh, dynasty here, no children. Uh, he did not like a lot of Irish uh, parliamentary figures. He felt that the English interest was constantly being undermined by self-seeking Irish landed types. Uh, but, you know, in some ways, every history gave him a bad press. But he had some quite redeeming features. I mean, he certainly was very much uh, motivated to address the issue of uh, harvest failure in Ulster in 1727-28, a previous very bad set of seasons, uh, in which uh, he was uh, probably more active than anyone in trying to uh, arrange emergency grain shipments. And in 1740, he was uh, certainly involved in Dublin itself, 
in trying to raise funds for charity. Then in 1741, when he was back in if you like, the levers of power with the Lord Lieutenant away, uh, he organised what we would call a great soup kitchen campaign in Dublin. He was the key figure in, what, for a period, feeding about 9,000 uh, people in a, in a city uh, of about 100,000. And he probably, if you allow for children, it meant that <coughs> quite a substantial part of households uh, were being fed. Now, Bolter wasn't just organising this, he was actually funding it from his own pocket to some extent, encouraging other wealthy people around him to do the same. Some did, most didn't. But Bolter was certainly seen after the event as a kind of uh, heroic figure trying to get uh, certainly the uh, crisis in Dublin uh, addressed quickly. And this painting here, and I'm sorry, it's a bad reproduction, it hangs on the stairs in the Prophet's house in Trinity to this day. Uh, it's, it needs cleaning. Uh, it's huge. Uh, it's very hard to photograph, uh, at least until it's cleaned and professionally uh, photographed. But why it's so interesting is it was painted after 1741 uh, by the trustees of the Dublin workhouse, uh, and they requested that the painting should hang in the workhouse, uh, and so it did until the end uh, of the, uh, the, the uh, workhouse at the time of the setup of the, the new uh, South Dublin Union. Uh, they gave the painting to Trinity. That's in 1840, where it's been ever since. But you can see, perhaps, you know, the, kind of, the artist is suggesting the, the poor figures who are kind of looking towards the benevolent archbishop, uh, supporting uh, act upstairs an angel or two. Uh, I mean, it's a, a certain genre, but it's, in, it's actually our only contemporary uh, painting relating to this uh, crisis that I'm, I'm aware of. But why am I mentioning Bolter? I mean, did he have any relevance? Well, he was the archbishop of the uh, diocese of Armagh, um, but he was certainly... Um, interested uh, in an idea that had been initiated by the Brownlows, by old uh, Arthur Brownlow back in 1699. The idea of drawing uh, like the line between Loch Ney and uh, Carling for Loch and creating a canal. Uh, cre creating a canal. This is an idea that uh, the then Arthur Brownlow and his neighbour, William Waring, uh, got taken up by Parliament in 1703. The idea, of course, uh, just slumbered for 30 years. And then in the 1730s, uh, it's taken up again, and in part uh, with the backing of Bolter, of Archbishop Bolter. And monies were secured from Parliament, as you probably know, to build that, for them, a very innovative lock between uh, Newry and the, the band near Portadown, linking into the, the loch. And of course, the idea was nothing to do with Lurgan. It was all to do with Dublin, to try and bring cheaper coal from an Irish source, from Coal Island, uh, down to Dublin to try and undercut the cost of Whitehaven, of Cumbrian coal, which was then the major source of heating for the city. Uh, uh, the canal, the, we normally know it as the Newry Canal, uh, reached, you know, the van after 10 years and was opened for the first movement of Tyrone coal in um, 1742, just after this crisis. Now, the movement of coal uh, seems to have been really rather unimportant. Uh, the link from Newry to Loch Ney uh, was uh, certainly um, something which one can assume the good people of Lurgan were very conscious of. And uh, as you probably know, uh, there was almost from the very beginning, I think certainly by 1744, uh, the quay built down there, and I presume more or less where the marina is today, the, the Kinigo got to, uh, land goods coming in from the canal and to be taken on the straight Loch Road towards the town, towards 
uh, the term uh, itself. This is from um, Roque's map of County Armagh, 1760. It's not as good an image as I would like, but it does, I think, just remind us uh, that there was a, a, an immediate reaction to uh, the building of the canal. Now, the canal, uh, really, as far as um, coal is concerned, as I say, had limited enough uh, impact, or even for the movement out of Lurgan's Linen. Lurgan's Linen went by cart to Dublin, not by ship, uh, certainly not down the canal. But what was brought up northwards on that canal, coming here and possibly to other jetties on the west side of uh, Loch and even to, perhaps to Antrim, uh, were timber, iron, flax seed, uh, kelp from the west of Ireland, potash, and at times of shortage, grain and meal. The, these local trades up the canal from far away reduced the carriage costs uh, for communities uh, around the lock. Uh, and this was never clearer than in the next crisis, uh, the next weather crisis. And that's really the kind of end of what I'm talking about today, uh, the kind of extension of that anomaly in 1744 and 1745. Now you probably think of 1745 in terms entirely of Bonnie Prince Charlie. You've got another uh, hook now, I think, yeah, because 1744 here in the north was a summer of rains, high winds in the early autumn, devastating local food supplies of wheat and oats. Indeed, across much of Ulster and North Connacht, it became known as the Rot Year. Uh, and it meant snows uh, then in the midwinter, indeed, for much of January and February 45, followed by floods um, and grain prices as a result soared. It did affect the potatoes, it primarily, though, affected the grain harvest in these parts. But unlike 1740 or 1741, this was not a continent-wide, a European-wide event, but fairly regional, seen even by people at the time as something that hit the north. Uh, Rotty, the, uh, one of our first kind of scientific writers in 1770, so Armagh, Tyrone, and Derry uh, had their distress much greater than then, meaning 1744, uh, than in 1739. And from across the way in Sligo, we have a remarkable memoir that was written, in, first written in 1750, by a Sligo landlord, Charles O'Hara, which has been uh, recently published. But this is written in the 1750s, looking back, if you like, 10 years. Um, 1744 was the, greatest, was the time of the greatest plenty of corn ever known and the fairest prospect of a fine harvest. On the 24th of August, a violent storm with rain so totally destroyed it that not one acre in ten was worth reaping. There, were indeed a, there was indeed a stock sufficient to subsist the people for that year. But in January, 45, this was succeeded by a violent fall of snow which covered the whole face of the country to the latter end of March, so that all kind of fodder being consumed, the people fed their cattle with corn. This food was too hot for them in their weak condition, and the cattle died, and the people starved for want of the corn. There is no misery which famine can induce that did not afflict our county of Sligo the following year, 45. Um, now, that was not unique to Sligo. That's perhaps one of our best descriptions of it. Here, um, I think uh, Francis McCrory noted that the Destry book for Shankill talks about 45 as that distressful year. Now, of course, it was a short crisis, and there were imports that took months to get, but imports available from parts of Europe and from uh, colonial uh, America. But for a bread-eating community like Lurgan, this was ominous for a time, for six months, shall we say. 
uh, both oats and wheat being badly affected. And the earnings from linen, which had held up so well in 1740 and 41, were uh, hit by uh, economic troubles in England and London, the fall in demand, um, which uh, directly hit uh, earnings here in the time. We have a particularly interesting comment uh, from that time from the curate of Shankill, uh, the Reverend uh, Richard Barton, which I won't read, but it's kind of quite striking, saying, you know, basically the, the big linen boys have dropped linen so poor is the demand in London, and they're becoming tanners now, because the, the, the cattle of the poor having died prematurely, they're, uh, they're skinned, and there's scope for uh, great expansion of tanning in the town uh, rather than uh, weaving. Um, and uh, that problem in London in '44 was certainly there for the best part of the year, because when news of the Jacobite arrival in Scotland and news of Bonnie Prince Charlie and the advance of the army all the way down to ultimately to Derby uh, really had a very sharp, probably short term effect on markets in England, which affected directly the, 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 what was happening here with linen. So you can see you know, politics affecting, if you like, market sentiment in England, affecting the earnings back here in a matter of uh, uh, you know, a month or two. And another dimension, excuse me, another dimension to the, it's like why 44, 45 is bad here, was of course there was a kind of uh, exit, the, 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 the uh, Brownlow family, uh, the, the, uh, William Brownlow had died in 39, uh, his widow was in France with the uh, heir, uh, who was still a minor. I don't know whether, I don't think there are any letters from Lurgan to Paris, uh, at this time, but basically you didn't have the same kind of support from the estate in 44-45 as you evidently did have a few years earlier uh, in, in 1740. But perhaps the saving grace now in 45 was that canal uh, and what was happening down at Kinnigo Gut or Port William, uh, which was certainly, uh, I think, uh, important. You have uh, the claim uh, to that effect uh, from uh, the Reverend uh, Richard uh, Barton. Um, you know, he's saying that, okay, there isn't perhaps going to be much coal yet coming from Coal Island. Uh, the public have spent 50,000 building the canal, uh, but we've had a great benefit. I, I know this has been uh, published before this comment, but I read it again because it's so striking. This is Barton, the local curate, in a, his essay on natural philosophy, a man of extraordinarily wide tastes. But he said, um, incessant rains during the summer of the year 1744 almost totally destroyed the, the fruits of the northern parts of this kingdom. And the merchants were obliged to import above 150,000 pounds worth of corn uh, for the support of the people and the horses for want of food. Uh, sorry, and the horses for want of food were many of them dead. So the punctuation is strange here. And the rest too weak for labour. This canal was of excellent use in contributing to convey the corn to the inhabitants of five counties, uh, all in the neighbourhood of the lake. So that moderately speaking, the lives of 50,000 people were saved by the canal. Now, I think Barton is exaggerating, but nevertheless, the point is that the canal, at the time when transport costs were high, horses were weak, and when uh, one wanted to get uh, the expensive grain in from Liverpool or Dublin quickly, the canal made some huge difference. Now, back to the, 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 the Paris registers, there is a bit of a peak in 45, uh, Donna Cloney, uh, Dublin, and so on, but as those who've been looking at these registers quickly tell us, uh, if you look closely at the registers, particularly 45, yes, it's a very bad year, but it is children that are dying. It is principally uh, something in the order of uh, two-thirds of the burials in Donaclony are children, just as some of the terrible peaks here in the Shankill register are uh, child death. And that, of course, leads us 
quickly, but just for a moment, to an almost separate story. The way in which smallpox was virulent in uh, the first half of the 18th century in a particularly uh, devastating uh, way. Uh, that every few years, in parish after parish, where we have any kind of evidence of death, you see this shrinking impact on children, not infants, but children and uh, teenagers, those who hadn't been exposed during uh, the previous uh, cycle. And that, of course, was to be uh, arrested. Well, first of all, you have the itinerant inoculators. Uh, it may have had some impact on the declining impact of smallpox in the mid-years of the 1760s, 1770s. But of course, the big breakthrough, which is captured here in that famous image of Dr. Edward Jenner, was uh, the coming of cowpox vaccination. Very topical, of course. But the point is that, you know, in the 19th century, smallpox was a very minor part of the story, even when there are many other killer diseases about it. But in the 18th century, particularly in the time we've been thinking about this evening, uh, smallpox was, uh, it had a, a, a terrible effect on uh, infant and child mortality. And it was tending to peak in those years of bad harvest, not because it had anything to do with nutrition, but because during the years of hardship, there seems to be more human circulation and movement, possibly in cold winters, people huddling up together more so that certain types of virus were able to circulate more efficiently. Uh, smallpox certainly is there, in, uh, as far as we can tell, in 41, certainly there in 45, but thanks to Jenner, uh, it wasn't a problem, uh, or almost, it was a very minor problem in the next uh, century. So that's one kind of positive thing towards the end to say. The other is, of course, sorry. The other is, of course, to remind ourselves that the, the linen industry grew and grew and grew here in Nagami. You have that kind of golden age from the 1740s over the next 50 years, so that this becomes very much not just the centre of linen, but a fine linen, and it affects not just these counties, but the strength of the linen industry in its kind of pre-factory age is something that spread benefits out as far as Charles O'Hara's Sligo, out to Mayo, out to Gold. In other words, the demand for food, the demand for uh, yarn from the outer parts of Ulster by the heartlands of the linen industry hereabouts uh, was something that helped to raise uh, the income of the poor in those areas in the second half of the 18th century. But that unfortunately didn't continue. That of course is part of a pre-industrial story, not uh, in the age of the factory, uh, that did not apply. Uh, and uh, <coughs> I think one of the things that is striking that because of the enormity of what happens in the next century with the, the Great Famine, which, after all, here in Lurgan, uh, I understand from Jerry McCasney's work, McCasney's work led to the death of over 1,100 people. You know, with the enormity of the Great Famine, uh, these earlier crises have been kind of erased from memory, or almost erased. So all I suppose I'm trying to say is they're important. They, and they, for those that lived through them, they were pretty terrible. Uh, and the memory of 1741 as uh, Blian and a year of slaughter, certainly was strongly there in parts of the west and the south of the country, but not perhaps uh, in these parts. People, I suspect, in these parts might have remembered more uh, Balak Byrne and the uh, exodus of the Bonnie Prince. In, in the light of the present scares about climate change, where does this horror fit in? Uh, I think, if you'd asked me that question ten years ago, I would have probably started talking to you about the impact of, um, you know, unexpected events like volcanic eruptions on, um, you know, 
strange patterns of weather because there's no doubt that uh, the uh, extraordinary difficulties in the, in the years after Waterloo was because of uh, a particular once-off event. Um, <clears throat> but uh, while we used to say uh, that 1740-41 was probably triggered by some climatic, uh, some volcanic uh, climate forcing in Kamchatka in what is now the far east of Russia, uh, I don't think that actually is probably the most likely explanation. So in other words, there's a random pattern uh, to our weather, but there's also if you like, a much more fundamental a series of longer cycles before we had, if you like, the, the Anthropene. In other words, before ever uh, human activity was a factor. You have these very sort of long-run cycles. You have these short-run, you know, sudden, very sharp events. Uh, I'm not sure if that helps us deal looking into the future, but I do think one thing you can take from looking at the particular story I was trying to tell today is that you know, some societies are lucky to be more adaptable than others. And it's a lot to do with savings, to do with know-how, to do with social infrastructure. Now, we don't, there's not much uh, kind of solace, to perhaps, to be taken from that, because in a sense, we know that, that you know, there are strong countries and there are weak countries. But I think, in a way, there's also an element in which you can say that looking at what I was talking about, uh, serves a bit of a warning because people in 42 or 1743 say, oh, it's all over, it's grand, it's wonderful harvests, never had anything better. And then they had this kind of smothering snow and near disaster uh, a year or two later. Uh, so I suppose it's not very profound to say, but uh, we should always uh, tread carefully. I, I would, all I would say, though, in the one bigger sense, I'm very much uh, aware that the, the new kind of development of environmental history and particularly uh, climate history, which is you know, a very big thing in, in, in several of our history departments, is, it, is very exciting. Whether it'll help policymakers, I'm not sure. Uh, but for the moment, uh, what they're doing is certainly filling in on much older uh, climatic patterns, including in here in Ireland, through the use of uh, Greenland ice core data, tying it in with uh, Irish data. So it's very exciting looking at weather history, uh, but I'm not quite sure yet if we can stand up and say, uh, hear me, I, I can tell you what's going to happen. I'm not sure we can do that. And perhaps just as well. No. No, it, the Irish Parliament was in action then, up till the Union. Yeah. So you, I mean, <coughs> what you had, I mean, just to go back to Archbishop Bolter, Archbishop Bolter, and th those he served with on the Privy Council were members of the Irish House of Lords, and it's a you know, let us say for shorthand, it is a subordinate Parliament. But its powers were certainly uh, greater, uh, relatively speaking, relatively speaking, than Stormont's would have been at the height of Stormont's powers. Okay, so what I was wondering was, are there accounts of what representatives there were saying of what was going on and what it needed to be done? Very, I mean, you have fragmentary. I mean, the, 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 the kind of debates in Parliament that we are familiar with from a later period, in other words, Hansard and all that, uh, don't exist until the 1780s. We do, we have a lot of material on, if you like, what's going on in the Irish Parliament in the 1780s and 90s. Uh, very, very little from the period that we're talking about today. I mean, the Irish Parliament was a rather thinner, weaker organisation in 1740 than it was 40 or 50 years later in the 20 or so years before its amalgamation. Um, but nevertheless, no, it's, it's an interesting point. I mean, the point, certainly you get among Irish politicians in the Lords, the Commons, you know, great concern about uh, contemporary uh, uh, economic issues and, you know, decision to put 50,000 of public money into, the, into a canal here, you know, was based on a kind of mercantilist assumption that importing coal from across the water from the other kingdom 
was not as good as getting coal from Kilkenny or Coal Island or Ballycastle. Uh, in the same way, the toll, uh, toll roads were encouraged, the same way that you get the building of what becomes the Grand Canal and the Royal Canal in the south as well. So there is a kind of state building going on under the encouragement of an Irish parliament that's weak, but among, who, among whose members were some who had a very clear sense. Uh, I mean, they were conservative in many ways, but they had uh, a patrician sense of uh, how the country should be improved. And I mean, the most uh, kind of important example of somebody who is both conservative and uh, a kind of an, eco uh, an economic mind would be John Foster, uh, the, the Speaker of the Irish Parliament in the 1780s and 90s, uh, who uh, was very, very important in terms of the uh, later development of the linen industry, but that's another story. Would there, would there have been uh, many uh, regrets and trouble? Uh, uh, yeah, thank, th thanks. I, I, in my rush to get to Lurgan, I didn't say much about food rides elsewhere. But uh, the question is an interesting one. You know, clearly, social order is going to be under extreme pressure, uh, and it was from the early weeks of this crisis. Now, all things considered, you might say, uh, the lid was kept on the can, but you do have a number of quite striking episodes where either um, food in transit is intercepted, where food markets are attacked, where ships carrying grain along the Irish coast, uh, where I'm saying the particularly famous one in Drogheda, there's a case down on the River Shur at, at Carrick and Shur, where grain was being moved from Tipperary down by a water that I suspect up to this direction in 1740 where seven people were killed. Uh, but, I mean, taking all in all, the level of um, f uh, public action that, as recorded is small. Now, on the other hand, if you look at the growth of um, indictments at the county assizes in 40 and 41, there's a huge jump. And there's also a growth in... Uh, the transportation of persons indicted for property theft. So you can see there is a, a strong after effect in terms of, of uh, what must have been direct action taken by a lot of people to get food. But an awful lot of what happened, like the, the cutting down of somebody else's trees, uh, the interception of somebody else's cattle, would have gone completely uh, you know, unpunished because the system there wasn't... So, I mean, you, you sense, looking through the rather thin evidence... I mean, there was a, a lot of anger and a lot of fear and, a, and uh, a lot of danger. But, I mean, all in all, I think given the scale of what was happening, it's perhaps surprising it wasn't any worse than it was. And just as a kind of footnote to that, if you look at the Great Famine and the question of food riot and crime, and this has been studied and there's much richer evidence for that, it's quite striking that food riots, interceptions, direct action, all that is part of the first year and a half of the Great Famine. And whereas in the second half, I mean, from 47 up to 1850, it's almost absent. Now, you can explain that in all sorts of ways, the changing pattern of relief, but possibly also a kind of wider level of demoralization. But thanks, that's a great question. <coughs> Well, I go back to John Post, who, as I say, tried to get data for about seven or eight countries. And um, the evidence would suggest that, uh, the, that England was worse affected than Scotland, uh, but they were certainly affected. By the, Scotland is a particularly interesting case because uh, there, compared to England, the, uh, except perhaps in the wealthiest parts of Scotland, there's a weaker poor law. In other words, it's somewhat closer to the Irish end of things. And also, uh, in parts of Scotland, uh, going back to the previous century, you have a number of exceptionally bad years. I mean, the 1690s in much of Scotland was as bad as what we've been thinking about here in Ireland in the 1740s. But 
as far as the great frost is concerned, there's not a sense of the kind of social crisis in Scotland, or certainly in England. Uh, the, I mean, I suppose I go back and say that while the, the frost may have been as bad, you're talking about a richer con a country with more uh, uh, wealth, a different income distribution, and a, a functioning poor law. You really have to go to countries on the continental Europe which were poor. I mean, Norway is nearer Ireland in that respect, and possibly some of the uh, Polish lands would be nearer in terms of that. But England, yes, it got hit by the frost. Uh, the subsequent strange weathers that I've been talking about in, in the 40s don't seem to have had uh, as much uh, a serious effect. I mean, the, 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 there are other very bad years in the 1700s and early 1800s that affect uh, the English economy, but uh, they don't have that kind of total breakdown that we seem to see here for, for some time in Ireland. Could you summarize in any way what the real impact of the Blue Shield was in 1741? Well, what I was suggesting was that <coughs> for people who are in the West, in the Midlands, and in the South, that the potato had already. Uh, potatoes, and at that stage, uh, a very large uh, sort of um, buttermilk consumption uh, was the basic diet. And certainly the potato, possibly even the buttermilk, was very badly affected. So in other words, the winter diet of you know, more than a, probably 60% of, pop of the rural population of Connacht, much of Leinster, all of Munster, was knocked out in a week at the beginning of the frost. And what I'm saying is that they, while they, they could switch to some extent to what was the summer food uh, in the first seasons, uh, stocks of that were not being replenished. And while the potato is somewhat more successful in the second season, 1740-41, it's still, because there's very little, there's a deficit of seed, uh, the, the stocks are very low. So the, the, in, in other words, the, I mean, we don't have anything like the abundant evidence on uh, food circulation that we have for the 1840s. But the sense is, you know, that uh, uh, tens of thousands of people had to make do with uh, emergency foodstuffs through the period from, let's say, spring 40 to summer 41. So you have these references, particularly in 41, to people eating stuff off the seasides, eating weeds, eating nettles, eating <coughs> charnock. Uh, so there's this the sense that until you get the, the first potatoes and, and, and the beginnings of the harvest in 1741, there's a, an absolute dearth of food. And this is partly why people are crowding towards the, the ports, where there is the uh, assumption that there's, you know, there's soup kitchens, that there's some food, and it's somewhat cheaper. Uh, so. I mean, that's, it's hard to put it, I, we can't put it into kind of quantitative terms, but that's the sort of picture we're getting. Does that help a bit? Yeah. Was there a reference as well that, hmm? I find this really hard to understand, that was that cold? Was it was that cold? Yeah. Well, I mean, you have, you have the stories about, you know, of kind of hypothermia, hypothermia in the towns. You don't have many stories about it in the countryside, but I mean, where would, in a sense, we don't have this kind of uh, monitoring of what's happening in the countryside in the way that you do have a century later. You know, so, uh, I mean, I, I think it's probably fair to say that most people who died didn't die in the frost. They died of the consequences of the frost knocking out the food supply, and that impact was delayed. So whether candles could or couldn't be lit, I think you know, the frost itself was horrific, but it, it was the, uh, the afterburn effects running through the next 12 to 15 months that really were uh, so serious. Thank you, David, and um, yeah, thank you everyone for coming as, as well. It's uh, great to see. It's nice to actually see something in person, actually, to, to, to be honest. And uh, thanks, I think, thank you to Brian O'Heiss as well for hosting us in uh, this uh, lovely venue. And um, I'd just like to say thank you, David, for coming all the way down from Dublin. I appreciate, appreciate after all, all the years of correspondence. <laughs>
uh, your comment, Ayn. So thank you very much. So, uh,